Pocket five. Jack's got nothing going. We'll hide behind Bogut. Howard is there on the step. Oh, this additional where are they now is a guy I would almost call the mayor of the NBA. And Pepsi brings you where are they now. And the one and only Jared Jack. Jay Jack, man, 837 games, 13 years. You've been on multiple teams, but everybody loves Jared Jack. What? Why do you think you have fit in with so many teams and so many players where everyone that talks to you is always kind of a Jared Jack fan? Uh, you know, I, I try to represent myself, um, you know, in a certain way. I demand respect, but I give it as well. Uh, I love to lead and I love to listen. So, you know, I, I love the uh, process of, of building what you would call a team or, or, or uh, building relationships amongst others. I like the fact that we have a, a common thing uh, as a collective, which all of us is, is the love for basketball. And from there, you know, different things are spawned from, you know, relationships. So we may have something else along the line that may be in common. And I don't know, man. I just try to be a positive uh, olive branch to anybody in need of anything, man basketball stuff, non-basketball stuff, whatever, man. I just, I enjoy being a good dude. So, you know, that's kind of what it is. For me. When I, I think of there's, you know, reading articles about you and remembering the year with the Warriors, so you had a quote that I, I steal and use a lot. As you say, some guys love the game and some guys love the life. And to me, you've always loved the game. And I think that your time with the Warriors you and Carl Landry had played together the year before and New Orleans had come to the Warriors. The team had been in the playoffs one time in 18 years. Missed the playoffs 17 out of 18 years. But it was you guys at the Vets that, that kind of set the tone for some very young Warriors. What was your idea of, of coming to the Dubs for that, that year? Because you brought such a, a great presence and feel to that locker room. You know, when I got there, you know, I, I vaguely or briefly knew Steph but I knew he was kind of uh, the apex of the team. You know, we I needed to kind of get in his ear and just kind of, you know, build with him a little bit. And, you know, his ideals and mine were right in sync. And I said, look, man, we I think one thing we have to do if we want to get to these places that I'm sure, you know, you and I want to go to is, I think it's a little bit of a change in mentality. I think when people play against the Warriors and they consider the Warriors, they always thought of them as a, a team who was, uh, heavy on the offensive end and then the emphasis on defense was never really there. So it was almost like a I'll, I'll score you type of approach and, you know, to buy into the defensive mentality. It's a sense of accountability, accountability, a sense of want to, a sense of trust, a sense of fight. And uh, I think once we established that, I think that's when things kind of started to turn uh, for the optics of the franchise and then just uh, as a core culture as, as well. And. Um, once that happened, man, the guys already had the talent. And once the two were able to merge, you know, then, you know, we the, the rest is uh, history after that. When you think back on that year with the Warriors, to me, that might be your best season. You know, you, you were 29 years old, you played 79 games, you shot 40% on threes, 13 points a game, whether you started, came off the bench, had a phenomenal playoff run, like, Jay, that, that might have been as good as you've played, and you've had a lot of good years, but I, I thought you were fantastic with the Dubs. When you think about that year, what are some things that come to mind about your game and, and that stage of your career? I, I think, man, just taking what's ever in front of you. Like you said, if I was called to start, then you do that. If coming off the bench, uh, relieving Steph in some areas, then you come in and do that. Um, you know, being a leader, being a being a, a positive presence, uh, grabbing young guys like Draymond, Kent Bazemore, uh, Festus, Harrison, kind of, you know, nudging them in the right direction, kind of showing them the way a little bit. Um, you know, I think all around, I really enjoyed all of it. You know, getting a bond with a, a coach who uh, was once in our shoes, played the game, played at a super high level, uh, getting to know an amazing fan base who are uh, fanatics about basketball and really take and respect the team so serious. Um, having an ownership group and a, and, a, and a management team that, you know, we're, we're passionate about uh, the process of putting teams together, you know, and then Mr. Lake up and Bob and, you know, everybody else. Um, 
you know, it was just a really, really great atmosphere to come in and do your job every day. And I think that translated and allowed a lot of us to come in and, you know, do a great job on the court. That year, when you know, I mentioned the Warriors have missed the playoffs 17 out of 18 years, you guys would go on to win 47 games, start this playoff run where the Warriors made the playoffs seven straight years and five trips to the finals and three championships. But to me, as that season started going, there was a feeling, like you said, better defense, great mix of vets and super young guys. And, and the game that will always stand out, and it's one of my favorite Jared Jack memories, is beating Miami in Miami and your pass to Draymond that won the game. Because I was thinking of you that year, end of shot clock, end of quarters, pressure moments. And I knew, man, Jared Jack could hit a mid-range. He could make a good pass. He's a great free thrower. What was it about you in the pressure situations that kind of brought out the best in your game that year? Um, You know, not allowing the moment to be too big for you. You know, uh, people may look at the, you know, it's last second, it's whatever the case may be. It's honestly just another possession. So I try to look at all of the possessions like they all matter. You know what I mean? I try not to look at the the possession in the third quarter with six minutes to go any different than I look at the one with four seconds left and we got to get a good look at the rim. We should always want to get a good look at the rim every opportunity. You know, obviously it's dependent upon the amount of time we have, four shot clock versus, you know, three seconds. But in those moments, if you're already prepared, the, the moment doesn't overtake you and it allows you to settle your mind down, focus, and then be able to execute. Did you see, if you're sitting there talking hoops with people now, that the, the puppy versions of Curry and Clay and Draymond, did you have a feel that, man, there's something special about these guys? Like, as someone who studies so well and is in the game, as you saw their careers ascend and that Warriors success, did that surprise you? Because you had a lot to do with it, the vets of those years and kind of grooming the guys the right way. Um, well, first, man, I, I one thing I want to do, I want to give those guys their own credit. You know, I don't want to be the guys like, yo, I, I did it and I helped. Th no, those, those guys had the tools and everything already before I got there. You know, uh, being able to apply them and making that a main focus on a daily, everyday basis, I think that's what I may have helped and may have uh, been a good reminder. Um, but I never want to, you know, take that away from those guys. That's one thing I want them to, uh, not only the winning, but the, the maturation process. I think that should be allowed to be thrusted on their shoulders and they should be proud of that. Um, sure. You know, it was just fun, man. I mean, that's honestly, I remember uh, probably right after a week of training camp, I called my agent because coming into the situation, I didn't really know what to expect. Going to go to state, like you said, a team who hadn't been to the playoffs in a, in a very long time. They just had a coaching change. And, they're still kind of filling in the pieces. Monte for Bogut trade just happened. It was a lot going on, you know. And um, you know, when I got there, I called my agent at the Friday. I said, "This is the most talent I've ever played with in my life." And he was like, "Really?" And I'm like, "Yeah, man. It's not even close uh, between Steph, Clay, David Lee, um, you know, Harrison. I, I saw as a young said, man, this kid's pretty good." You know what I mean? Um, Bogut wasn't able to work out, but his resume for me uh, spoke for itself. I had already been a teammate of Carl Landry. So I'm saying, man, and Brandon Rush, before he got injured, I'm like, man, top to bottom, man, this is a tough top eight, nine man rotation. And coming in, I was really, really confident, man. Um, people may look at you and say, yeah, that's easy for you to say after it all happened. But in the midst of it, man, I thought we were going to be really, really competitive where that landed us in the end. I wasn't really sure, but I knew we would have a team, man. I was going to compete for something. Do you remember that win in Miami and that last second play to Draymond? And and what did that win mean? Like beating LeBron and, you know, this super team there, creating Miami and doing it on the road. That was kind of an announcement. Hey, the, the dubs are going to be kind of legit this year. Uh, probably the biggest part I remember from it was, for me personally, was after the game. Uh, after we won, obviously everybody's excited. We just came off an amazing road trip. I want to say we won about eight out of nine games, I believe. Um, and everybody's super excited and, you know, celebrating to, to a degree. 
And I said, hey man, you know, it's all well and good to be proud of yourselves, but this this isn't uh, the pinnacle for us. You know, understand that these wins against these top tier teams should be regular to us. You know what I mean? We should expect to come here and win. We should expect to, uh, you know, play at top tier levels with these ball clubs. And it shouldn't be a, a almost like a shock, like, oh my goodness, we did it. No, this is uh, our capabilities and our expectation level. I think for us now, we should put the league on notice, but also put yourself on notice of what you're capable of and understanding that, uh, you know, you're setting the bar for yourself. And once you do that, you got to come out there and uh, be ready to raise it or elevate every single time. Take me through the, the night at Madison Square Garden. Back end of a back-to-back -back after Indiana, there's a brawl, there's <laughs> suspension, guys fly to New York. And a lot of people may not remember, you know, Mark Jackson used you and Steph together a lot. There was a, a lot of three-guard stuff he would handle. You were a good shooter. You could handle. Obviously, he's a phenomenal shooter. But Steph going for 54 in the garden in the back end of a back-to-back, -back, when, when you're sitting around talking to people about games, what, what was that game like? Uh, I, I believe, you know, obviously the stage of the garden. Um, and Steph just went went crazy, man. That was the first time I started seeing him hitting some shots. And I'm like, man, what are you? Oh, <laughs> man, what are you? And I'm like, oh, OK. He, he He's kind of all the way settled in, uh, you know, Confidence wise, uh, he's always put in the work. Um, and it was a, I think if, if for him, it was not the I've arrived moment, but when the game, I guess when they say the game is kind of slowing down and I'm more, I'm sure of myself, I'm sure of my abilities, I'm sure of these spots I can get to on the floor, uh, I'm sure of my body health wise. Um, still upset we didn't get that win. Um, but man, uh, an amazing, special, special, special performance. So that, that team wins 47 games. Like you said, solid on the road, better defensively, nice mix of vets and young guys. And you know, you're the underdog against Denver and yet you win that series. And to me, you know, you, you in the playoffs, you elevated to 17 points per game, shot better than 50% from the field. I mean, you were phenomenal against Denver and San Antonio. You know, take me through that Denver series, like going in thinking, hey, it's George Carl and it's Iguodala and it's Ty Lawson and, and we're the underdogs. But to win that series and, and just the feeling going into it, what are your reflections on, on Warriors Nuggets in that round one? First and foremost, uh, probably Coach Jackson. You know, um, for a lot of guys, it was their first uh, playoff experience and he was so steady confident um, and he had the ship settled you know from the moment we got to them from the moment we knew who we were playing and I just looked at him and the confidence he had you know it was, it was almost contagious to everybody you know it was tough when you have to look at the head of the ship and you can see maybe a nervousness at times or, or things like that uh, uncertainty um, and not for him it didn't waver, and that spoke volumes to me. You know, he always uh, exuded a confidence in all of us that we were capable of handling whatever task was put in front of us. And the one thing that I probably remember the biggest from uh, from that series, um, it, it was a bit personal between me and this person. Um, it sucked that, you know, D. Lee, I think he uh, waited nine years to get to the playoffs and he gets hurt in game one. Mm -hmm. and towards the end of the season, usually teams shorten their rotation. You know, now they're trying to make a push for the playoffs or uh, they're fighting for seeding. So the rotation gets a bit slim, guys' minutes get extended. I remember one game, uh, I'm looking at Draymond, I, I think it was like halftime. And I looked at him, I said, man, you, have, you haven't been in the game yet. He was like, no, obviously, you know, disappointed to a degree. And I just sat there next to him and I said, look, man, stay ready. Always get your work in. Don't be that guy that when you go out there and you're pissed off and you're sulking because when it, the ball does come your way, you're not going to be ready to take care of your opportunity, whatever it is. And crazy enough, he kept working, getting up shots after the game, playing one-on-one, -on -one, staying in the weight room, getting his conditioning and still, you know, ready to contribute. And for D. Lee to go down game one, 
I remember a shoot around, I grabbed him. I said, look, man, remember like last week, I, we had to talk. I said, bro, if you did not taking care of your body, you've been hanging out all night, indulging in things that don't allow you to be productive. I said, now look at you, man. You about to start in the playoffs as a rookie. I said, man, coach could have very well put Carl Landry in that spot. Somebody who's proven, solid veteran, can score the ball. You're taking a chance with a rookie in the playoffs. That's not common. I'm going to just let you know that. But if you're not able to take advantage of the opportunity given, then, you know, that's going to say a lot about you. And obviously, he was ready, contributed, played, played, played his butt off. And we were able to, you know, advance to the next round. So probably that exchange between me and Draymond that not a lot of people saw, not a lot of people knew about. That was one thing for me that after talking to him, I said, man, this kid's going to be fine. The, the fans have always been so thirsty for playoff success. They still talk about the We Believe team. But that win over Denver, give me an idea of what Oracle felt like and just the level of intensity and the crowd, because that was one of my favorite series. It was kind of the harbinger of things that would come later. But what was it like for you playing as well as you did the team upsetting Denver, and just the way the crowd was for those games. Man, it, it was crazy. Uh, I believe a football team at that point had just gotten in trouble for uh, pumping in artificial noise into the arena. So I remember when, uh, when we first got back, I wanted to see game three, and you could just feel it. You could feel the energy that the crowd was ready to get going. It was, a, it was an entertaining playoffs up, up until that point. And, uh, I remember one of the coaches from Denver saying, there's no way that this is just fans making this noise. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, nah, man, y'all doing something to make it this loud. I said, brother, it's been like this all season. It's not just the playoff, it's not just today. So if you think that, I wouldn't bet your money if that's what you think. You know what I mean? And just, uh, they want to, to be a part of, you know, that whole journey. and. It, it was mutual, you know. We wanted to share that success with them, and uh, us coming out, hearing the support, and the way they voiced their support, uh, it, it was flattering, you know. And I, I've always had a, a affinity for fans, you know. Certain ones, obviously, they you know bad ones in the bunch, but the ones that really truly come to support, and because you know those people can spend their money anywhere they want, you know, they work hard, they have a job, um, show families, um, other things that possibly, you know, their, their hard work can can go to. And to come and want to spend it on a product like us, and just to come see us play, obviously that gives them a sense of fulfillment. Uh, for us to reward them with, you know, positive play, positive product, positive uh, feedback or mutual relationship, you know, that's something that's always been personal to me. So for them, man, it was it was always special for me with, with, with those, uh, those fans. And it always will be. One of the loudest, you know, kind of sustained runs during that Denver series was Steph Curry's 22-point third quarter. And, I mean, we've seen the pyrotechnics now throughout his career. But when a guy gets 22 in a playoff quarter at home and the building kind of levitating, you know, what was that like to be on the floor with him and see that? And then, like the Denver game, or like the Nick game, where you're saying, wait, these are shots that... What's this kid doing? Man, he he, he just dominated yeah. that third quarter against the Nuggets. What are your remembrances of that? Well, I just, I just remember him kind of getting in the rhythm and, you know, us making plays, and I don't know why, but they kept helping. I said, I'm going to find him. If anybody leaves him, it's going right back to him. And he was able to get into one of those step groups. And uh, I, I remember there was a point where he, uh, I think he hit a few in a row and they called a timeout. And uh, he was going crazy, hype with the crowd. He came over to me and one of the five, and I was like, <laughs> backing away from him. I, I hope most people didn't take that as I'm leaving him hanging. I was like, man, brother, you are on fire. I don't want to touch you. Stay hot. I don't want to mess any of this up. Stay where you at, brother. I can't. Nah, you need all this. You doing all this by yourself. And it was fun to watch, man. Um, you know, just everybody coming closer together. Uh, during the point of the playoffs. You know, us in Denver, we kind of had a bit of a, a friction, uh, some amongst the players, some amongst the coaches, but all in, you know, good competition. 
And, uh, you know, that was fun, man. But the, the adverse situations, you know, brought us together in the midst of it, man. And I think that's why those relationships that we made then, uh, they still, you know, hold strong today. So that's the part that I probably took away most from that series. I got to ask you about the the other half of the Splash Brothers because the San Antonio series to me is is memorable for a couple reasons. But Clay Thompson's 34 in winning Game Two in San Antonio, you know, you got to remember, Jay, the Warriors hadn't won in San Antonio in forever. It was like one of the longest losing streaks ever, and for someone to been with the team for so long. You know, we get on planes in San Antonio and thinking, you know, mark it as an L and keep on moving. And to break that streak, and I know it was a playoff instead of regular season, I still counted it. To win in San Antonio, particularly as heartbreaking as the loss in game one, that, that showed me so much about the team. And it also showed me Clay Thompson could put himself in a different level that I don't care who the opponent is, Clay could have that kind of night. It was later 37 and a quarter against Sac and 60 against Indiana, you know, 14 threes in a game against Chicago. But but you saw it in a playoff thing. We've talked about Steph. Give me your thoughts on Clay Thompson and that win and, and Clay's performance in that game. You know, Clay was the the bright point that I think people took longer to appreciate probably than probably everybody. Um you know, as, as a defender, because uh, usually guys who shoot the ball and score at the clip, the heat, the, they don't take on the onus um, of defense on the other end. You know, I, I think his athleticism, quickness and speed has always been something that's been underrated or just just not not, not known uh, by a lot of people. And for me to see it firsthand, uh, how good an athlete he was on top of, you know, his scoring ability was, it was surprising, but I was like, man, this kid is, this kid is gonna be gonna be special. Um, coming back in that series, uh, you plan you got a, a team that come out of nowhere playing against Tim Duncan, Popovich, uh, Tony Parker, Manu, you name it. When you look at it, you're like, yeah, this should be a cakewalk for them. And I thought, you know, we fought them tooth and nail. I think experience for them was was mainly the deciding factor uh, rather than you know talent for talent. Um, love playing in that game, man, or that series, I should say you know, going blow for blow with those guys. And I think we just ended up running out of gas, but Clay, you know, those, that moment uh, was another thing where I believe he also arrived, but he put people on notice. And to give this person credit, Mark Jackson was the very first person who grabbed me, I want to say maybe 10, 15 games into the season. He grabbed me, he said, Jared, man, that's the best shooting backcourt in the history of the game. And I'm sitting there thinking like, ah, man, it gotta be, and, you know, when you sat back and thought about it, and I was like, yo, man, you're right. And for people to say it now, that was something that he saw early on. And I'm sure it's something he probably saw before, you know, mentioned it to me. Man, that dude was, he was special in that regard. And, and just knowing uh, the abilities and capabilities of his players, man, it was just, it was just tremendous. Well, I got to mention game four of the Spurs series for the Jared Jack game because you had Steph Curry with a sprained ankle and you're the one with 12 points in the fourth quarter in overtime, the building going nuts, you making all the big plays. I mean, as I said, 17 points a game during those 12 playoff games, shot better than 50% from the field. I mean, that, that was some of the very best basketball you've ever played on a huge stage against an elite team and all the Hall of Famers for the Spurs. That game four for you to tie things up in 2-2, that was the Jared Jack game, man. I mean, down the stretch, you were the guy. That's got to put a smile on your face. Yeah, you know, um, we, we had felt like we had given a game away. Game one in that place, we felt we should have been coming home 2-0 uh, um, with an opportunity to play two games in front of our home crowd. And, um, you know, Steph had, a, had an injury. And I remember, man, just going out there saying, man, I just got to figure out a way to come out here and, and get this win. You know, I, I felt the bit of personal responsibility uh, in losing game one with that last possession that we had. We had a bit of a miscommunication, me and uh, Harrison, that allowed Manu to be open on the, on the weak side. Um, 
But I said, man, we get it some way, any way possible. And if it's in the form of hustle plays, assists, it just ended up being, you know, me being, uh, me scoring in that particular game that, you know, helped in a lot of ways for us to get that W. But, you know, I was on a by any means necessary uh, type vibe that game. And just so happened I got the ball, coach trusted me, believed in me, the, the players did as well, and was able to, you know, maneuver and make some things happen. When you sit back and, and think about your year with the Warriors, did it make you a Warrior fan as the team went on to the finals and won titles and things like that? Were you sitting back thinking, these are still my friends, I got great memories with those guys, and as a basketball aficionado and someone who knows the game so well, did you enjoy the Warrior success? Is that something that you had a hand in, but you also, as a fan, sat back and said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm happy these guys have, have won the way they've won? Oh, for sure. You know, I think when you have an environment that uh, you don't even have to say it, but organically it feels like a family situation. You know, um, those feelings never leave. Um, you know, even though I've played in the league 13 years, I'm still, when people see me, they attach me with the Warriors all the time. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, Oh man, you should have been there for the run and they didn't bring you back and whatever the case may be, that's fine. You know what I mean? Like I, I've always been of the mindset like what's for you for, is for you, what isn't, um, isn't. And I take great pride in being one of the uh, foundational pieces that kind of uh, started what, what we know the Warriors organization to be today. Um, you know, and I, and I get my credit from people that, uh, that I hold in high regard. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to come from everybody in the world, you know? Um, I still, I talked to Draymond the other day. I talked to Steph probably a month ago. And even if we're not on a daily talk by talk basis, just uh, that unknown synergy that we have, will, uh, it will never go away. And that's not just for them, that's with the fans. That's, I'm sad that I will never get to go on Oracle again. You know, I look forward to stepping in the Chase Center one day, but you know, you know, those locker rooms, walking down that hallway, uh, the guys that, that worked in the back who would, you know, escort us in and out the uh, arena. Um, you know, everybody there, man, it was just such a very inviting uh, atmosphere that I just appreciated all of it. And it would never be forgotten, never not appreciated, and always uh, have a special place with me. Finishing off, Jared, with just a, a thought to, to Dub Nation and just, as you reflect on that year with the Warriors and the love that people showed you and the importance you have in the story and the journey of the franchise, you know, if you could talk to those people and Warrior fans just kind of one more time, what, what would you say? Give, give me kind of a, a Jared Jack memento for, for Warrior fans that year in your life and your career and, and what it means to you. Uh, the one thing I've, I've... I, re I remember to, to a T where uh, the last loss that we we lost the series to San Antonio. And, uh, you know, as they're subbing everybody out, you know, guys getting emotional, the season's over, we put so much hard work in. Hate to see it go, you never know what may happen in the course of six months with free agency or whatever the case may be. And um, when the game's over, we're obviously shaking hands with the other team. And then I was about to walk in the tunnel and then I just hear the fans, Warriors, the, the, you know, much famous chant that it is now. And I just looked around, man, and I just appreciated uh, the effort. You know, the game's even over, and they're still giving us effort. They're still giving us everything that they have. And I just walked around and kind of took a laugh, and was just clapping for them, like, thank you. You know what I mean? And if I can't say anything else but that, it's just honestly from the bottom of my heart, thank you you know, helping us create that atmosphere um, is so much of a two-folded thing that people don't really realize. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's so much that goes into being a professional player. You have so much that you shoulder, uh, more so than just making the ball go through the hoop every day. You know what I mean? And coming to a place where you can get uh, some emotion from somebody, some positive emotion that uh, triggers you to go out there and maybe put those things aside, man. It's, it's, a, it's a calming, but electrifying and 
aggressive to a degree presence that you know helps you go out there and try to do your job man uh when things make it difficult at times so you know all i can say is thank you man. So, and if i can say it a hundred more times thank you well jared thank you for taking the time on where are they now can't wait to see you at chase center your basketball journey is not done and just listening to you talk about hoops is super fun we appreciate you taking the time man Thank you, man. Hope you guys and everybody's family is doing great out there in the midst of all this craziness. My prayers with everybody, man. Please try to follow orders as best you can. I know it's a bit difficult. And, uh, you know, hopefully sometime soon, man, this thing will be over and we'll be back to life as we know.